Okay, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to the East Bay Seed Collective show. We're doing something a little differently. We have our get, we're pre-recording our show, um, and our guest is Steve from Potent Ponics, and he is joining us from Thailand. Thank you very much for um, accommodating me in your schedule. Yeah, thanks for uh, uh, doing the recorded show. I know it was a bit of a a bit of a thing to try and coordinate, but uh, I apologize for not being able to do it on your normal time. But thanks for having me on. No, man, it's all good. I mean, two in the morning is 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 asking quite a bit. Um, so my first icebreaker question: Do you want to do a, a softball or do you want to jump in? Yeah, whatever you want to do, it's all good. All right, let's start with the. I like this to jump in with the kind of a deep question. Um, I assume that you've been in the cannabis industry for a while. Um, and what I'm really curious is how do you balance work with anything outside of cannabis? Uh, I mean, mostly most of my, my universe revolves around cannabis really. Like I don't, <laughs> once in a while I'll take a short vacation or a, or a weekend away, but that's like, I don't know. I, I, I spend a little bit of time maybe playing a little video games here and there. I enjoy hiking and foraging like mushroom hunting and stuff like that and uh out here in thailand looking for snakes i love photographing snakes and stuff like that so um and fishing but other than that most of the time it's just focused on my work like i enjoy what i'm doing i'm working on a book on, on cannabis and a bunch of other stuff so it's kind of like i don't really get a break or i'm listening to like stuff to be, to get better at my job i listen to other people that i, I enjoy listening to in terms of learning from and, and trying to always take in new ideas so um, I don't know. I don't really give myself a break, but I don't really not like what, you know, when you like what you do all day, you don't really mind. <laughs> now, um, like for me, I started as an indoor guy and probably had, you know, had plants going for maybe almost 10 years before, like my lights were ever, you know, fully shut off. Um, then I moved to like kind of more of an outdoor person, which was nice because, you know, during the different outdoor seasons, you kind of are doing different things. Um, Thailand is equatorial, correct? Or is that, is it sub equatorial? No, we're, we're full blown equatorial. Yeah. Um, and it's all here year round. So, so that would mean basically you're, you're growing year round. Is that correct? Is there any like downtime? So we do have a dry season and a wet season and you do have to kind of account for that when you're, when you're growing. So the dry season here tends to be a little bit cooler. Um, it starts around uh, September, October, and then goes until around this time, like it's just starting to break into the wet season right around now. Um, so, you know, by April, it really starts to swing into the, into the other mode. And by May, it's raining every day again. Um, and, um, and, and then you have the rainy season, which is the, uh, the other half of the year. And, you know, it's much more humid and you kind of have to have strains that are much more uh, considerate of, of those types of things and much more, you know, humid and mold tolerant during that time and then much more, you know, dry tolerant during the other time. So you just kind of have to have two different sets of plants really for, for the different times of year. That sounds kind of fun. Um, is that also why I, I was um, looking on your, your feed that you guys were in greenhouses? Is that also the reason why is for the wet season? Yeah, just, you know, keep the rain off the plants and uh, allow us to keep going. And then also to pump a bunch of air through there, right? Even if it's kind of more humid, uh, if I can keep that air moving, you know, through those plants, you know, we can totally deal with that. Even if it's, you know, 70% humidity, you know, as long as that, that leaf surface is dry, you know, we can kind of get away with that. Interesting. Um, let's go into, to, um, the places that you've grown. Let's let's start with that. So you were saying just briefly, um, wh where have you, where have you grown cannabis? Sure. So uh, I, I grew up uh, in the Philadelphia area and uh, kind of cut my teeth out there, and then ended up out in Colorado uh, and California. Uh, also spent some time growing down in Jamaica, um, uh, both on the uh, west end of the island and up in, uh, in the Montego Bay area, and that was a lot of fun. I learned, and I learned a lot from that uh, and a lot of different experiences growing up in the hills there. Spent two weeks just on the south side of the island just learning you know, all I could from, from the guys up there. So that was a blast when I was uh, starting off. Uh, and then um, I've also grown out in Africa as well. I spent some time in Zimbabwe 
um, on a uh, old tobacco plantation where they had kind of taken over and uh, were turning that into a cannabis facility. Uh, and that was up until COVID. If it wasn't for COVID, that would have taken off and the, the stuff in South Africa would have gone much better. But uh, uh, with COVID happening and all that stuff, uh, it kind of uh, threw a wrench in all that, you know, and uh, I caught one of the last flights out of the country uh, to get out of there. So that was a little bit scary, but uh, made it back in time. And then um, about now here in, in Thailand, which is a, a whole different experience. It's a little bit more br brutal on the heat side here than uh, anywhere else I've been in terms of combo of heat and humidity, but um, still doable, just uh, a little bit rougher than uh, just about anywhere else that I've grown for sure. Um, so I, I live in the Bay Area in California and um, from what I've gathered, it seems like growing in the tropics is quite more, is more, is more difficult than growing in California. Is Significantly that, more difficult. Yeah. You have, you know, six to eight times the amount of different species of insects. Uh, you have molds that appear much faster. Um, you kind of have to always be putting on different probiotics. So we're every other day we spray the plants with something. So one day it might be very Bassiana, the next day it might be, uh, metarizium the next day it might be a, a combo product um, we have another one that has um, six different types of beneficial fungi uh, that will kill different insects uh, and, and then we sometimes will use spinosad at least on the moms or we'll use you know some other you know uh, natural based um, pest pest control for the veg stuff and then in flower obviously we're, we're just going to stick to just some some mold light mold, um, microbial mold controls but um, we have different species than the stuff that you guys use over there in the States uh, when it comes to those, but they're very similar, you know, in terms of application. And obviously at the end of flower, you're not going to use anything, but um, that, that tends to work really well. I mean, we're not having many issues. We're also adding in things like lactobacillus and uh, some of the other beneficial uh, stuff from Korean natural farming, as well as IPMO, which is like a modified version of IMO that uh, works as a pesticide for, uh, for killing insects really well, uh, where we take, a third of the uh, the rice and replace it with insect frass. And we have a whole video series on my YouTube channel on that as well. Uh, if you're looking for a new uh, addition to your, your pesticide stuff, that's something that you can create yourself, you know, something you can harvest yourself. It's not something you're, you're reliant on a store or anything like that for. So we really um, had a good luck with all that stuff. We really haven't had too many issues, maybe a little bit of issues here and there with trips after wind storms. Um, they're kind of getting kicked up into the wind and it seems like after that we have to spray for them for a week or two to get them back under control but uh, other than that we really haven't had anything too crazy um, you know a little bit of whack-a-mole here and there with one or two things on the outdoor plants but nothing nothing too wild at least so far awesome where did you um, discover adding insect frass to your lactobacillus Oh, so we, we don't actually add it to lactobacillus. We add it to the, the IMO collections. Oh, so, to the IMO so, collection. I see. Yeah, yeah. So when I was working in Zimbabwe, um, when the COVID hit uh, or started to take off, they sealed the borders. And we kind of got cut off from imports, right? Like whatever was in the country is whatever was left. And that didn't last all that long. So um, we kind of had to come up with a solution. So I hit up Chris Trump and he was like, hey, I had really good luck with this with weevils. Why don't you try it? And it worked really well against the grasshoppers we were dealing with in Zimbabwe. And it totally, you know, annihilated them uh, out of the field that we were working on in the first trial with. So uh, what came back after COVID and uh, used that again a couple of times in Oklahoma, again, for treating the grasshoppers and um, uh, what's it called? The, um, it's another beetle, a uh, bomb, um, blister beetles, uh, and uh, what was the other one? Um, leaf hoppers. It worked really well on all three of those in, in Oklahoma. So those are some other things that uh, we've had really good luck with as well as Japanese beetles. But um, that really seems to work incredibly well. And again, we have a whole 20 minute video series where it kind of goes step by step uh, through that whole process. That's awesome. I definitely need to check that out. Um, so it sounds like there's a fair amount of chewing insects in Thailand. Is that right? Or I mean, just in general, in, in the tropics, there's a bunch of moving chewing animals that are kind of, you can't really kill them and you can't really spray poison on the plant that they're gonna eat because that's poisonous. Um, 
and I guess you would use like a, a greenhouse or some kind of physical barrier, but you know, they still find a way to get in. Um, well, is that, is yeah. that kind of a correct? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. We're, it's only really the, the thrips that can blow through the screen that we're really having any kind of occasional issue with as far as uh, entry. And even then it's, it's a really minor issue. You know, they're, Oh no, they discolored the lowest leaf on the plant. Like, not like, Oh no, they're, they're mulling the crowd, you know, the, the biggest issue is that they're the it's the end of the dry season it's only rained here once since october so we have the only green plants left anywhere around so they're just looking for water really right right i had a, a friend and he would call them good luck thrips because you know because he didn't have root aphids and he didn't have broad mites he didn't have spider mites he was like i just have a few good luck thrips we're okay it's not too bad <laughs> <laughs> so I always called them the good luck thrips. Um, what, uh, what things did you learn in Jamaica? In Jamaica, they do a lot of, actually, one of the interesting things. So they'll take a bunch of fruit skins and then mix that with milk. Uh, and then they'll ferment that for 21 days uh, and make like a finisher to, as like a terpene booster. And that seemed to work pretty well. As, as some of the, and they use that like week two week to week four in flower kind of get the plants to really you know burst out uh, and that was kind of an interesting thing it seemed to also kind of increase the bug resistance i don't know if how that worked but they certainly uh, when they sprayed it on the plants uh, and veg even uh, it seemed to make a bit of a difference in terms of what was getting eaten um, that was really in interesting and the other one of the other interesting takeaways when they do large scale seed planting so they'll take all these seeds and plant like um, three or four of them in, in each hole all across the hillside and then on week three and week four after germination once they pop up all the tall ones are the boys and the shorter ones are the girls and all the tall ones they'll, they'll just pull all of those out uh, and then the, they, they get rid of like 99.9% .9 of the males by doing that which is blew my mind because I never knew that was even possible but it, it only works under 12 12 conditions it won't work if you're you know, run in 16 or whatever, it, you're certainly going to notice a difference with your males, but uh, not that kind of instant, you know, yes or no kind of answer, which really blew me away. I never, no one had ever taught me that in, in the West, at least. Interesting. That's, that's kind of how I do my selecting now. Um, I mean, I know, you know, I'm also selecting out a few of the outlying females that are really tall, but, but that is, you know, I'll plan a bunch and like usually mm, going into veg or maybe like uh, three weeks into veg, the top 25%, I end up just, just kind of calling and just kind of constantly calling the top 25. And I usually have about 75% females. And then also a lot of the males that come in later, I like using for breeding anyways um because they are a little bit stockier for me um so yeah I, I do also use that that technique um in jamaica did they what is up with this with like the strain selection out there because i know that like there's pressures from out outside sources there's also you know like land race or heirloom jamaican strains and combinations of of the two um there's no no there's no land race left on that island there wasn't any in 16 when i was there it was all gone it was all basically hybrid of like dutch and yeah all of it was hybrided hybridized all of it was westernized and you can go i have videos up from it too on my youtube all of it was westernized hybridized like completely interesting i the, i haven't seen anything maybe 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 a little bit up in the blue mountains but if there's anything left it's on the eastern side of the island where where it hasn't been quite so polluted but on the western side of the island it's so many tourists have brought seeds in there and they themselves have brought in a lot of weed seeds to to boost yields that it's just all ruined if you're looking like there is no land race to making anything left in my opinion interesting so like if uh a tour so me as a tourist i've been to jamaica gosh the last time was like 12, maybe 12, 13 years ago. Do you think the scene was different then than it is now? No, it was, it's been ruined for a while. 
So what what was I smoking back then? Because I mean, it definitely was quite a bit different than what I'm what I smoke here. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm sure it still has some notes of some other stuff, but I'm just talking about like pure stuff. But not compared to like what I've seen in Thailand and Africa, it's not not even close. Like it was very clearly had some outside genetics to it now. Uh, I see in terms of junkiness and size and and how quickly it finishes under the tropic on the because none of the tropical stuff that's from there finishes in eight weeks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like. <laughs> So, so there's stuff in Jamaica that's finishing like eight to 10 weeks now. Dude, when I was there in 2016, they had a strain called 48 and that would finish in like 50 days. Wow. And they were, they were from seed to harvest. They were doing like 75, 80 days, like really fast turnovers. So the genetics are basically now hybrids from all around the world, but because of the environmental influence, um, I mean, do they do they have like a more modern look to them, or does it still seem like tropical bud? I, I mean, they just look like a hybrid, so they're they still have some of that fluffiness and some of that uh, original sativa structure with smaller buds that are kind of more spaced out on the plant, but they don't and they, but they're much more dense um, and tend to have more mold problems and stuff like that than they kind of you know, should really for that kind of area. You also don't have that uniform, like for instance, in Thailand here, the Valley I'm in, in Pechabun Valley, all the, the stuff that I can get from the locals is like very lemony dominant. But if I go up to like Karat or a little bit farther up north, it switches to more and more ma mango dominant because that's what's more, you know, resistant to the mold or the insects or whatever in that area. Uh, and then if we go all the way up to like Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, start to get some stuff that has like some sandalwood notes and some other stuff like that so because that's working up there but you don't have that kind of like zonal thing where i can smoke it and immediately kind of have an idea of what what area it came from in jamaica because it's all all the guys for a long time have just been focused on export um, because they already have plenty of stuff coming in from south america that they're also repackaging aside from weed uh, right. I, I've seen it down there. Um, so, the, you know, they're just focused on money, right? Like they're just trying to get paid and, and bulk out. And, and so they had no reason to save any of that stuff. And even, even some, like, maybe you'll find a small Rasta village or something that like has some old land race left. Like maybe you'll get lucky on that, but that that's going to be the only way you're going to find anything left down there. And even that, I would still be surprised if they didn't have some pollen that blew in because people are pollinating like crazy down there. And that wind, I mean, it'll blow in the wind there. On the, I mean, you get five, 10 mile an hour winds all day long there. So you never quite know where your seeds came from, you know? Interesting. Interesting. Um, what did you like smoking in Jamaica? Like, was there anything that, that stood out to you that you thought was pretty nice? There was some definitely some interesting cultivars when it come came to like fuchsia purple hairs and like purple structures of the plant and purple flowers that I hadn't seen anywhere else and still haven't seen anywhere else. Um, but that was really maybe the only thing that really stood out. Flavor wise, it was all pretty in the middle of the road. And do you think that's from the like the genetics or like the cultivation? environment and you know like infra like lack of infrastructure type of uh, thing that's going on I think, it's just, I think it's just because they're just it's kind of like a bunch of runs like if you, if you go back and even check out the video i did there's not a single pound of of anything in that field like four acre field right every plant's like a different pheno right. so where it's as a breeder it's it's like heaven right because <laughs> but if as someone trying to resell flour it's like a schizophrenic mess right so, so right. i have like the two ways to look at that so there's no consistency on anything so it's hard for anybody to kind of breed anything out it's all like a bunch of like mud muddled down brown colored not brown strains but like if you take all the different colors right and you mix them you get brown so you don't you don't have any real uniqueness to it it's all been mashed together and they're just looking for size of bud really i see interesting at um, least the stuff that i saw yeah um 
Interesting. Have you been to Bob Marley's house before? In uh, what is that? Nine Mile, Eight Mile, Nine Mile? Yeah, yeah. I've been to the house, his house, his mausoleum, and then they have a museum there in uh, in uh, Kingston as well. Nice. Um, yeah, I've been there a few times, and um, they were like, "If you want, you can smoke in his mausoleum." And I remember I did that uh, a few times. Um, gosh almost 20 years ago, but that was, that was really special. Um, how about uh, Africa? What is, was it like um, growing in Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe was cool because I had a license and I could have weed on me and like most of the rest of the country that was, was facing like eight to 12 years if they had it on them. So I could go through a checkpoint with like a grip of weed and as long as I was the one who had it, there was no problems. It was really fun to go through a checkpoint and be like, here's my passport. Here's my weed permit. Here's my pound of weed. Get fucked. Like, <laughs> um, that was really cool. But uh, also, so in Zimbabwe, when I was there, first off, the government owns like a small portion of your your company or they have like a stock holding or, you know, they whatever. They own a part of the company just for any weed company there. And then we had to be within 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers of a military or police facility. So we, we were within um, 10 kilometers of an Air Force base. So if and we had two of their soldiers that were stationed at our farm at all times. Um, so uh, we had like, you know, the best security ever. Like if someone seriously tried to rob the farm, we could like call in tanks and an airstrike. Like it was, it was pretty great. Um, it, it became a bit of a problem though, because like, um, so we had like a warthog that was kind of getting into the field. And I was like, yo, like, can you go shoot that thing? Like I'll cook it up for dinner and I'll cook you guys dinner. Like just, you know, go shoot him and, and, and I'll, and I'll cook this thing up. And, uh, the guy goes over and then like throws a hand grenade in the hole and blows the shit out of this thing. And, and it's like, dude, I can't cook that now. It's like full of shrapnel and dirt. Like we, I asked you to shoot it, not blow it up. Anyways, that was fun. Um, but, uh, but in terms of like um, growing, uh, it was really, really great. We had uh, uh, almost all women in terms of workers. Um, the women there, they actually the people that work the fields and know what's up with the agriculture. The dudes, you know, work in the markets or work in the shops or work in town or work in mining or have some other some other job. Um, but the women are the ones that know, hey, these this is the insects you need to worry about. This is the type of soil that you need. This is the good fertilizer for this or that or the other. Um, also started to do a lot of work with um, like working with termite mounds and and some of the Korean natural farming stuff around that and hadn't, hadn't had access to large amounts of that before. Um, so that was interesting. And then also teaching them all about KNF and, and how to like, they're used to burning out all the grass and everything before planting. And we got them to like, not do that. And we're like, look, you have this fungi underground that's holding water up by the surface. Wow. You don't want to burn that out. You want to keep that fungi there holding the water up by the surface. <laughs> So let's just plant the cannabis, you know, we'll, we'll cut our little line in between, but we're going to leave the grass in between and we'll just cut it down lower later on. Or we'll bring the, the animals through and, and cut it down once we harvest and then replace the crop to cut the grass back. And once we started doing that, man, we didn't have to, you know, the, there was a noticeable difference in the amount of water between that and then the control field where we, we burned. Um, and it was, you know, quite a bit of a difference. And then also just, the plants did better. They had less problems. Plus the bugs kind of had something else to eat. You know, they weren't just solely focused on the cannabis. So mm -hmm. um, that was another big takeaway. And then just also just perfecting that IPMO, which really saved our ass with the grasshoppers um, was the other big takeaway out there. Uh, the other, the other thing that came out of that was the idea for the open nutrient project, seeing nothing but Syngenta on all the, the fertilizer stores made me want to kind of do something about that. So started working on trying to, Put all of those nutrient data for different crops and stuff into one place it's a little more organized easy access to which uh, anyone can check out at opennutrientproject.com and we have a a really cool uh, new version of that we're working on right now that'll be uh, much easier to use and a little bit more in depth and uh, and interactive uh, it's just going to take a little bit more time to finish and so open nutrient project is a website that you guys are putting together that's a collection of information regarding how to create your own nutrients and 
feed them to set specific plants? Yeah, so we actually have, uh, uh, it's already live. So the first version of it, it it's still uh, adding a few new bells and whistles to it, but you can go on an open nutrient project.com, select what nutrients it is that you need. Uh, and it's all sorted by Latin name, by average nu uh, nutrient parts per million. So if you want to find what's high in potassium or what's high in, um, um, you know, this, that, or the other uh, in your, um, 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 uh, you know, sorry, it's a huge gecko just walked by. Uh, we have geckos in the house. <laughs> nice. <laughs> totally distracted me. Um, so uh, you can basically find, okay, well, this plant in my yard has high in potassium. This one's high in phosphorus. This one's high in whatever, whatever. And then from there, you can um, uh, utilize that to balance out your compost or your ferments or your compost teas or whatever it is that you're wanting to create. So, and it's agnostic, right? I don't care if you're into KNF or Jadam or um, soil food web or hydroponics. Like this gives you options to create whatever it is. I'm trying to give people the toolbox and they can decide how to utilize that within their, you know, to solve the problems that they need rather than trying to tell them how to fix it. That's awesome. I mean, for me, I felt like, cannabis has been a gateway into gardening other things learning about my own fertilizers learning you know learning about my inputs um learning how to make my own inputs you know like i don't make all of my inputs but i like to make some of them and i strongly feel that it's nice to know how to make something so that then you can make the choice on if you want to make it or if you want to buy it and you kind of have an idea of what it truly takes to create that specific input um kind of like a small little anecdote like we purchased our house and you know i'm not the most handy person but it's nice for me to kind of learn how to fix things in my house so that i know okay like you know sanding the wall i can do that some other things are a bit past my pay grade but it's good to like learn about it and know you know what i mean what what goes into these things um yeah um that that's that's super interesting i guess also like what i've recently learned i mean it was just a quick youtube video was you can make your own bone meal um by just cooking up bones and then smashing them up and there you go you have bone meal um i didn't realize it could be that simple uh so so yeah, and, and for me, the um, my, I guess my passion is regarding earthworm castings. I really love compost and earthworm castings. And to me, that really seems like the magic ingredient that I find makes my stuff pop and really pulls out the, the terpenes in which I feel like that's like the, the thing that makes the difference between like good cannabis and great cannabis are you know the people who can pull out those those um subtle flavors um so yeah i, I mean i'm sure all your stuff has flavors because i know that you know stuff that's grown you know with k and f and g dom all that that type of cannabis from my opinion has the most terpenes and seems to be a bit more potent as well Absolutely, yeah, and we actually feed uh, either IPMO or IMO, liquid IMO, uh, one or the other, every other watering. So we do, um, you know, a light feeding, then uh, the fungi, and then regular water. We just do one, two, three, one rotation uh, for all of our watering, and it constantly gives those plants, you know, a new injection of different microbials that, you know, help keep those plants' immune systems stimulated, which increases your secondary metabolite production, uh, and then uh, increases the terpenes. For sure. Also, I've, I've noticed that. Um, so here, let's jump in. Um, you were saying that in Africa, they use Syngenta, which is synthetic, right? I mean, I don't know the name of it, but it sounds like some gnarly major agro business, which is, that's correct, right? right? I mean, yeah, they're, they're basically up there with Monsanto or Scott's. Um, they're uh, kind of the, the other one that's slowly taking over the world. They, um, they're there bigger than the than those two than the other two 
so the P I mean, before Syngenta came into Zimbabwe, I'm sure they had their own native agricultural techniques that they are using. Um, well, before the British, yeah. Before the British, so that so <laughs> is so is a lot of those kind of traditions gone since it's been like. Do they have? Do they still use those traditions, or is yes, it only no. salt? Yes and no. So that they do have some traditions and, and some methods, but a lot of it, a lot of it's been lot like a lot of that knowledge and the, the the more knowledgeable people there were kind of um, not valued as much during the British and uh, 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 maybe is the polite way to put it. Um, so they're not around really anymore to teach other people um, the way that you know maybe some of the other people also like. A lot of the country there isn't like yeah they did agriculture but they weren't not in the same kind of way that like the west does with the larger scale stuff or even even in southeast asia with the larger scale farming it was much more small scale like okay growing enough for my household or my household the next door's household like much much more hyper small scale um in africa than it is anywhere else that i've seen so is it kind of like subsistence farming in a way? Like, it's not yeah, 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 yeah. Just enough for them. Yeah. Um, but you do have the one exception to that is the San people there, which are amazing at the Khoisan. If anyone ever gets a chance to learn about them, uh, they're amazing. <laughs> they, the original natives of that part of the, the world and, and they go back 60, 70,000 years and uh, they can, you know, go anywhere and just pick up anything and, and know exactly what what's useful and what is it and all that stuff and uh, learned a lot we had one guy there that was one of his you know parents was that and uh, he taught me a whole hell of a lot in terms of like okay this one's good for this and this one's good for this and blah 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 with the different stuff that we had on the property that's interesting um would you say that like native indigenous cultures have similar types of agricultural techniques just using different products or does it seem like they have different techniques with the different um geographic locations i mean in some ways it's similar so all of them kind of have a different way of adding fungi or microbial biodiversity like some kind of equivalent to like leaf mold or imo or some kind of uh, com or composted kind of inoculant some 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 one of those three uh, is definitely present in, in most of the stuff that I've, I've been around um the other thing is is that like lactobacillus ferments like some kind of milk based fermentation seems to be pretty widely uh used even in, in from jamaica to knf to southeast asia here in, in, in thailand you know they all have some kind of version of either rice wash lactobacillus or milk based lactobacillus that they're utilizing either as a mold control or as a fertilizer or both. Um, so that's something that seems to be pretty universal as well uh, when it comes to kind of, you know, looking at it from a more macroscopic view. Interesting. Um, what were the strains like in, in uh, Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe had some pretty interesting stuff. We had everything from like really horrible, like very clearly like, bushweed like something that was like some ancient sativa that like didn't have a single crystal on it <laughs> um that was more like a hemp or something like a fiber hemp or something all the way up to um some really nice cerebral sativa when i was up in uh, in yanga uh, up on the eastern side of the island if any or the, the country if anyone's ever goes out to zimbabwe um take some time and, and um, go, go to some of the Rastafarian cafes in Harare, and then you can meet some cool people. But if you go out to Inyanga, there's a bunch of Rastas and stuff that live up in the, the border between um, Zimbabwe and um, Mozambique. And uh, a lot of those guys grow some fire, um, including um, this really high alpha pinene, like just super, super ultra sativa -y, like cerebral high that I haven't felt in a long time. Um, but what was interesting too there is like they brag about like whether or not there's snakes in their garden because when they have really dank resi weed, the snakes will come and like rub themselves on it to like get rid of the parasites on them. And like to that to them is like a, 
a blessing from the, the the snakes or whatever, but it's like a way for them to like know like brag that their weeds like ultra dank, which I thought was like half insane because of how many venomous snakes are there. And then also just like a really funny, interesting local way of bragging about how good your weed is. <laughs> yeah. Are the, these are poisonous snakes, right? Well, they have green mambas and black mambas there and spitting cobras and like they have the full gamut of stuff there. So boom slangs and twig snakes and I could go on. I mean, I've, I've grown in, in what is that brand scum and like mendo and we had like rattlesnakes in the property and that was not something we would brag about i mean we would try to kill those guys because you know they'd like be sunning you know like right next to a patch you don't want to like you know spook one um so okay so in in zimbabwe so i guess in in africa as well as in asia that's more of a like Jamaica as well. That's more of a flower culture, right? I mean, that's not that's less so of a hash culture and more of like in the Middle East and India are are hash cultures. So, do you find um, that there's? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there would be a difference in morphology and like the qualities of these different plants. But are, do you are, have you observed that like these plants that have been bred for a while for for flower smoking as opposed to for hash? And, and is that correct? that those are for, for flower smoking and not for hash? Yes and no. So in Jamaica, they definitely have hash culture, like, but they call it gum. Um, and they totally have, it's very similar to like um, Nepal or, or stuff like that. They're longer sativas. They're making up for that longer flowering time by getting some, some hash cultures off of it um, beforehand. So they get two or three harvests off that plant and then still sell the flower. Um, you know, I've seen that happen quite a bit on, in Jamaica. Um, so that was totally, you know, right up there with the rest of it. Now in Zimbabwe, um, you know, they, they didn't have any of that because weeds, you know, illegal for most of the population there. So um, you might, I, I, I had some hash because we made it, but I didn't have anyone offer me hash the whole time I was in Zimbabwe. Um, I, I could have bought it actually from this one guy, but, you know, that was a separate situation. Um, but uh, and, and then in Thailand, um, you know, hash isn't currently legal here right now in, in Thailand. So, um, well, except for if you're getting it through a university or a hospital, you can get it. So, but other than that, um, you know, you can't just produce it and sell it the way we can flower, for instance, under our licensing right now. So, um, but that's going to hopefully change here in the next few months. Um, we'll we'll kind of see what the government does. They have an election here in May and that's going to, really decide with the future of uh, cannabis legalization here in Thailand. So let's, let's, t let's talk about that. How is legalization in Thailand going? I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting. So um, we don't currently have any taxes, which is, I think the only legal market right now that isn't taxed, which is uh, quite interesting. And I think they didn't, uh, I think, I don't, I don't think they thought that part through. I think that, uh, you know they should at least be getting five or ten percent at least a little bit back so that that keeps them happy right because you got to keep them happy and making money otherwise they, they get pretty cranky um so um we only have to report what our total plant count is and how many pounds we our kilos we have on hand um for sale um we don't have to really report much else um i mean we kind of have free reign to do pretty much anything we want to um, obviously you need to, to register stuff if you're going to import it, although it's not hard to find and pretty much any seeds that you want within the country at this point. Um, other than that, I mean, there's a flood, it's kind of like Oklahoma in a weird way where you kind of have a flood of people that are like, Hey, I can get a license for cheap. Let's do it. And then everyone's growing, but like only a tiny percentage are actually growing quality that you'd actually want to smoke. And everyone else is kind of just growing. <laughs> get their hands on as far as seeds go so uh it's kind of this weird clusterfuck of you know a bunch of really low quality crap and then a really my tiny minority that's growing stuff that would be on par with western standards and uh it's going to be interesting to kind of see what happens i think a lot of people are going to jump in or about to jump back out of the boat um, is there any indoor cultivation going on in thailand 
definitely in, in Bangkok, but the power prices here are pretty expensive. I mean, uh, it's not very economical to do it when I can grow in a greenhouse for a hell of a lot less and grow something that's just as frosty. So it's, you know, it's kind of hard to justify the prices, you know, there, it, and that is one other thing that's kind of crazy. I mean, we're still getting like anywhere from 16 to, to $34 a gram, depending on what city you're in. Uh, and there's no ounce break or anything like that. That's, that's what it is. So you're seeing pretty outrageous prices here still. No, no, no. Again, I can still get a cheap bag of weed. Like I can go down to my local one here. Um, not too far from my house from the locals and get stuff for um, 200 baht, which would be, I don't know, seven bucks a gram, eight bucks a gram, something like that. I don't know what the current exchange rate is, something around those ones. So, I, but that's, that's, you know, the village prices, but you go into the, any of the tourist areas or into the cities, you're looking instantly at like, you know, 15 plus. Okay. I mean, but that still seems like right around, I mean, it's kind of around where, where things are here in California. Um, but I guess there's, there's no price, there's no break. Um, and there's no like track and trace or anything like that. You just like report however many plants you have. And like, as far as who you can sell cannabis to, it's just like people can just sell cannabis. Basically it's not illegal to sell. Is that how it is? Or are there like dispensaries? No, no, no. You have to, yeah, you have to be licensed to sell weed. Uh, you know, anyone can have 14 plants. Um, if you have more than that, you have to have a license uh, and then you have to apply, you have a cultivation license, and then you have your retail license, um, your retail license, um, you know, is what you need in order to sell. And then you can't sell to pregnant people or to um, uh, anyone under the age of 20. And is that the drinking age also in, in Thailand is 20? Yep. Um, what are the genetics like? I'm really curious. Like what, what's the, like not, yeah. Like what are the things that you're excited about? Sure. So, um, of the, as far as Thai stuff goes, um, I found some really interesting chocolate stuff and, and coffee stuff. Uh, although not a lot of the, we're not, not any really good luck with any of the chocolate stuff so far, but uh, we have a new round of chocolate stuff. We're going to be putting into flour here this next run. Uh, starting next week. So hopefully we'll find some stuff. Now, all the chocolate stuff from the first round either ended up being Hermy or ended up being um, uh, just not very chocolatey on the flour. Like the veg stuff smells like chocolate. And then in flour, it smells like something completely different, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. So we'll see if it smokes all right and tastes good, but I'm still not thinking it's going to be very good because, excuse me, traditionally the, the chocolates um, tasting terps tend to smell like a, a like DMT kind of smell, like a pl burnt plastic bag or an, a, like an electrical fire, like a um, like a power strip that got too hot, you know, mm -hmm. like that kind of weird smell to it. That's yeah. really on the tongue seems to have that that chocolate taste to it, uh, at least to me. Um, but uh, th the most unique one by far, a buddy of mine found. We call it Temple Thai. But he found uh, my buddy Canatai seeds went up to a Wat, which is like a temple here, um, and uh, found these monks that had a, these huge, like 20 foot tall plus cannabis plants that just had like colas the size of like your bicep or your leg. And uh, he managed to trade some feminized seeds for them uh, and, uh, and get a whole bunch of seeds uh, from those uh, monks. And the vigor and the size, they're like the redwood trees of, of weed. Like they're at after six weeks of uh, from germination, they're pushing nine, 10 feet tall uh, and like st stalks on them that are like, you know, three inches around. Like I've never seen a, a cannabis plant grow like this. It's insane. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to playing more with those genetics and finding out. And it smelled really, really awesome. Peach chirps, peach and sand, like a little bit of sandalwood to them. Um, so the, I think they're like a Himalayan strain. I think that that's part of the reason why they have that bigger is that they, they're used to having that shorter summer. So again, purely speculative on that, but the, I've never seen anything that quite grows like those things do. So we've been pheno hunting that him and I both have been pheno hunting those pretty hard 
to try and um, you know find some good breeding stock with because uh, that's going to be one of our first breeding projects. We have a uh, seven breeding rooms here at the facility uh, where we can breed every you know whatever we decide to breed out uh, that, that's going to make sense for for production. So uh, and we're going to stabilize and preserve a lot of the old Thai stuff that is worth keeping. Um, and then also, you know, throw away the stuff that isn't, but we're trying to, to keep, you know, two or three of each of the different um, uh, Thai stuff that we can do to, to back cross for preservation, because right with all these people bringing in all these genetics, if we don't do that, it's going to be lost forever. And I've already watched that happen in, in, in Jamaica and, uh, you know, we can at least preserve that stuff if we're quick about it. For sure. I saw you also have like a, a clone room is it difficult to keep clones in that kind of environment? Absolutely. Yeah, we definitely had a learning curve. Um, so uh, one thing is uh, here, the humidity <laughs> fluctuates pretty extremely, at least in the dry season. So we have to put uh, humidification in the rooms. And, uh, and in the beginning, for the first week or, or first three to five days, we put domes on them and we pull them off. Um, that seems to help a lot with that. And then the other big learning curve um, here was, uh, and I'm used to just throwing them in domes and letting them rip in the States. And, you know, a week and a half later, they're, they're good to go. But here um, we couldn't do that. Where and the other big thing was uh, transplanting. So instead of transplanting them directly from uh, like rock wool or, or starts plug directly into the soil, we're transplanting them into a smaller root pouch um, that's like, a, I don't know, the size of like a, a Dixie cup or whatever, and then letting them significantly gain a larger amount of root mass um, for an extra week before we put them out. Um, and because without that root mass, they don't have a big enough root system. And when, when they go out into the sun, even with a 50% shade cloth, they're just getting cooked. Like we, with the, the first round we put out there, I think we, we, we salvaged about 70% of them, but 30% of them just fried. Uh, and then we're like, okay, we gotta, we gotta do something a little different. So we ended up giving that extra time, but giving them an extra five to seven days. One, the, the vigor difference, they hit the ground running when you put them in the greenhouse and just roar, uh, most of the time. And then the other thing that helps a lot with is that they just have a big enough root system to kind of, to take that. Now it's been 107 degrees here the last week or so. So it's been a bit brutal. Even even giving them some bigger root mass, I mean, the plants all shut down by 10 o'clock and then, you know, they all are, are drooping a little bit by 10 o'clock because even with the shake cloth, it's just so freaking hot. Even with the, you know, the fans and everything, it's just, it's just hot, you know, so they shut down for that midday sun, you know. Interesting. That's something else I've seen with a lot of land race, you know, the bigger sativas, the, they'll shut down from like, 10, 11 o'clock in the day until about two or three, and then they'll start to, to turn back on. I've noticed that quite a bit. That's super interesting. Um, do you notice any growth differences with uh, your seeds versus clones? Um, not particularly. Not really. Um, I don't, you know, I want to kind of stabilize everything. Also with seeds, you know, you never know if you're going to end up with viruses like mosaic virus or something else that you're, you're looking for. So, um, you know, that's one thing that we've kind of purged out um, now that we've had most of our stuff, not all, but the majority of our stuff has been here for a couple months. Uh, um, a lot of it's already been flowered out or is in some stage of flower right now. Um, you know, we, we can kind of see what what's going on with all the different cultivars. So that's good. Um, do you guys have to worry about hoplite and virus? Is that, has that made its way to Thailand that much? I mean, we're definitely concerned about it. We actually use bleach in all of our containers uh, for all of our workers. Um, if you guys check out any of the videos that we've done, uh, uh, we have the um, bleach in the water with all of the scissors and all that. And then, uh, you know, they have three sets of scissors for each one. They, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three with the scissors. And you know, by the time that you've gone back to that same pair of scissors, you, you've been working on two other plants, you know, that whole time. So it gives you know five or ten minutes in between each uh, uh, each one, depending on what you're doing. But we're doing clones now, and you know, three thousand a night or so. Um, and it's too hot to do them during the day because you know the plants are just again all wilt, you know, turned off in the middle of the day. You, you can't do that. So uh, we generally start cloning around six o'clock at night, and then. Uh, kind of go into the evening that way man that sounds like a tough night 
<laughs> it's not too bad. I mean, I'd rather do that than than the heat, but I mean, you literally can't do it during the sun here. The, the clones, half the trail will be dead by the time you try to do it. It just doesn't work. Right. You have to do it. And do you, do you guys end up doing a fair amount of work during the evening time, be, like basically in the morning and the evening because it gets so hot during the daytime? Yeah, what we do is we work in the morning and then we'll work until about lunchtime. And then uh, after lunch, I generally have them working in the indoor space, the, the nurseries, or we have some indoor breeding rooms or, you know, making soil in the shade, or you know, we can generally find something that's not in the direct sun most of the time. Uh, for the afternoons, at least when it's this hot, you know, but also they're way more used to it than I am. Like I'm used to the heat, but this is next level. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, God, I can remember like working under plants, you know, like in the shade, but yeah, at a certain time, it's like, if the plants aren't growing, I felt like if the plants aren't able to grow, then you probably shouldn't be outside. Um, but man, that's, that's intense are there i mean so as a land race enthusiast like my mind goes to like oh you know what genetics from where can we you know can go to thailand and they'll be even better like is there any of that like stuff from like any kind of like hazes that are you know like neville's haze type stuff or cough type stuff that's in thailand crushing or like what's what's the what's the take on that one I have some Neville Hayes crosses actually. I have an A5 and I have a, I forget what the other one is, but um, the northern northern Thai stuff, I would say, if you're if you're strictly bumming around for seeds, um, the stuff from up north in Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai, you're probably gonna have better luck finding some interesting stuff up there than anywhere else. Everywhere else is gonna be, you'll find some good stuff, but it's gonna be very like samey. Whereas up there, you're gonna find a little bit more diversity, I guess. At least from what I've seen, for sure. And like, are people like are people growing? Uh, like stuff from the United States there, or like you know, like high. No, no it's it's pretty much Thai Thai outcrosses yeah. mostly. Yeah, because especially if you go up like north west from from Chiang Mai, like. So to get up to where you have the hill tribes and stuff, those guys are like not sharing weed with nobody, like except for you know a couple people here and there. So they're they're very much like autonomous almost, uh, except for the the current political situation in the country next door. So um, you know that that's where you're going to find stuff that hasn't been contaminated. That's that's got some uniqueness to it. I guess is kind of why I was as more recommending it is that 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 stuff has not been contaminated anywhere near as much. You know. But anywhere near Bangkok, Pattaya, Phuket, yeah, forget it. All that stuff is people from everywhere. But up the farther you get from civilization is where you're going to find the more interesting stuff. Um, would you say I grew some Burmese a few years ago? Was that last year? And, I mean, obviously in my environment it didn't show nearly, you know, its potential. But is there things similar to, like, a Burmese that are grown out there? Or, would you, or is that um, similar to a Thai? I haven't had any Burmese stuff. We have some Laos stuff and Vietnamese and Cambodian stuff, but uh, there isn't a lot of uh, easy trade between um, Burma or what is now Myanmar yeah. um, uh, because of the war right now. There's a for those of you that don't know, there's a pretty uh, pretty gnarly civil war going on right next door to Thailand. Uh, Thailand's a safe place, but uh, um, they don't really allow much of anything to come across the border. And then you also have a lot of um, both sides of the war, the government and the rebels are uh, funding, um, you know, uh, uh, meth production basically to sell, to fund, to buy more guns. So you, they're very much looking for anything coming across that border right now um, because of that. And it's a very big, like, no, like meth is a very big no-no here in Thailand. And uh, it causes a lot of problems. And, um, you know, I, I don't like meth heads either, so I don't have a problem with that. But, uh, um, you know, it's something that, you know, compared to Cambodia or Laos, where I can just throw them in the back of a pickup truck and drive across the border and it's not a problem. 
Um, you know, whereas Myanmar, you know, you're going to get, you know, they're going to search every inch of the vehicle and there's just, you don't have the same kind of trade coming across that border that you do on the other side of the country. Interesting. Right? Because of the. That's very interesting. Um, what is Thai cannabis culture like? Uh, okay. So like um, people, so you have much more like a village style. So like anytime we hang out with the local Thai homies, we have some friends of ours that have a Kratom and cannabis farm uh, right around the corner from us, like 10, 15 minutes away. Uh, and we hang out with those guys in the, in the village there, people in the village there. And then sometimes we'll hang out with the villagers here in the town where I live. Uh, and uh, it's mostly like hanging out, sit around a table, smoke weed, you know, drink, drink a couple beers or whatever, play some music. Maybe, you know, it's very similar to the States. Like it's, it's, it isn't that much different um, in terms of like uh, events. You have a lot of lounges. Um, they're, they're kind of quasi legal. They, they didn't want them legal, but then they kind of were kind of semi legal again. A lot of bars are really cool with it. As long as you aren't smoking inside the building, um, you can kind of sit on the porch and smoke weed. So that's like most of the time people don't harass you. Like I was at a big festival. Like, or like a big temple show where they have like a big stage show with like 150 people in costumes. It looks like carnival. It's pretty wild. And I went and smoked a bowl and like this head police captain or cop dude comes over and just asked to smoke weed with me. So I just smoked a bowl with him and we watched this thing together and he walked away and I thought for sure I was about to get a ticket. And he was like, I just want to smoke some weed. <laughs> so, you know, you don't say no to them, you know, but, uh, and that you know that's been been you know really the only kind of thing um that we've had here uh haven't really had too much negatives uh, or anything like that when it comes to that um um i don't know we had lots of little events you know lots of like uh two to four hundred person cannabis events with little booths and stuff with local businesses almost like little farmers market style maybe that's kind of a better way to put it so that lot that's a really kind of cool thing because of all the food markets and stuff they kind of just applied it to weed um you also see cannabis like whenever you see like a, a plant market where you have like lots of different fruit trees and stuff you'll see someone has a bunch of weed plants and they'll say like conga long or you know kd or any of the other more famous thai strains that people are trying to find right now out here um, usually it's not what it is it's just whatever the local shit is but once in a while you get lucky and it's something decent um uh, and then in, in the, in the cities, it's pretty wild. Like you go out in Bangkok or Pattaya or um, Phuket or any of the other bigger cities. And, and you'll see people that just have like a table set up with like a bunch of jars and it's just the shit they grew and they have a license to sell, but it's not their shop location isn't there but because they have a license and they can kind of get away with it. Uh, and um, that's kind of interesting too, where you kind of have that, again, that kind of farmer's market kind of, style to it where they're just setting up a table and selling their stuff and that's perfectly cool like uh, if only it were that easy in the states you know i love that it's like street food and so i just wanted to to go in how is the food there i love thai food <laughs> yeah the food here is the best part of thailand uh it's not even just thai food like they have so many different kinds of food and there's always something that's in season now that wasn't last week that it's really cool and then just like I have an amazing market that's like a mile from my house uh, that's twice a week. And then there's, you have the night market that's at 1 a.m., which is in the next town over. And like, there's always someplace cool. You can also like, um, we kind of have a, a way better version of like Uber Eats because like they'll go to any of the street vendors or whatever else around too. So you can get them to stop at like eight different places and like get the craziest munchies order at like three o'clock in the morning and have them deliver it for like, two dollars it's fucking amazing like <laughs> that's awesome now the food there is mad spicy right or it can depends. You... It depends. It's all over it all over you know everything is spicy but lots of fish lots of pork lots of chicken very little beef like very little beef it's hard to find good beef um but so many different types of fruit and just none of the food is fatty or like yeah but lots of sugar and everything so like the mayonnaise has sugar and like everything has just more sugar than it needs to have 
Uh, even their own version of Coca-Cola is like entirely too sweet. Interesting. What is your favorite? Um, what is your favorite food to eat there? As far as fruit, it's going to be the same as Jamaica. In Jamaica, it's sweet sop, but uh, here in Thailand, they call it um, noina. But uh, as far as Thai food, they make these really amazing garlic. It's like garlic fried, garlic oil fried uh, pork ribs that are. It just tastes so good. It's like basil and garlic and oil and pork ribs. It's so good. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I've had that was like incredible. Really amazing sushi places here too that are like all you can eat for like nine, 10 bucks, you know, that never gets old. Oh, that sounds nice. And the, and the fish is fresh, right? I mean. Oh yeah, everything here is super fresh. That's awesome. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm assuming uh, what papaya salad is dank out there. Oh yeah, we have I have two papaya trees in my yard. Awesome, that's so awesome. Um, so let's go into. So I wanted to talk, I guess, a little bit more about the genetics in Thailand. So it sounds like what you're saying is that most of the genetics are you were saying samey Thai. Like it's just it's not nothing special. There are a few things that are nice. Most of the stuff that imported is not so nice no i mean the imported stuff has has been all right like uh we have some really really nice stuff that's definitely you know more western than uh, than thai um that we're working with a lot of larry chimes crosses soto crosses uh some puck and some red lebanese puck oh uh, some other some really fire stuff uh that we're working on out here that's much more heat tolerant again trying to keep in mind sativas narrow leaves um, you know, you can't come in here and be growing Afghan and Paki stuff. Right. Maybe some of the Marif stuff that's more narrow leafed, like um, uh, that kind of stuff, but none of that wider leafed. And, you know, none of that Kush stuff is really going to do, do well here. It's just going to fry. Like those leaf structures cannot handle the, the sun here. They just, you know. But at the same time, things like a freak show actually do really well because of that. You yeah. can put them out in full sun here and they don't care because there's not enough leaf structure to get enough heat for them to care about it. Interesting. I did not think of that. Um, yeah. And do would you do those types of genetics during the drier season? The more Western hybrids or just the stuff that's imported, not Thai? Is that more during the dry season and then more Thai stuff during the wet season or, or not necessarily? Well, I mean, in theory, yeah, but um, there's also a lot of, of Western stuff that really is uh, pretty humid, humidity tolerant. But uh, in general, yeah, you'd want to stick to more local local cross stuff uh, to deal with the humidity and the bugs that come along with the wet season because you have much fewer bugs during the dry season as well because you don't have all this extra food sources for them to feed on, to, to breed on. Interesting. Um, do you, I mean... I assume you probably get some OG and some gas stuff. I mean, do you, are you able to get any of that? Do you miss it? Oh yeah. Well, no, I definitely have quite a bit. I actually have some um, cherry OG freak show crosses, which is really, really, really nice. Um, actually, I'm gonna smoke this one. Pink, uh, pinks. Um, and uh, what else do we have? A couple OGs, but not many. Um, again, really just kind of purged everything that's wide leaf out of there. And that really kind of did it itself. The only two that we had that were really wide leaf were black garlic and the um, uh, blueberry. And the although we did find the blueberry OG seems to do okay, but the blueberry itself and the black garlic and what was the other one? The big sweet uh, and the white widow jada. All of those were much more wider leaf cultivars, and all of those had heat, heat stressing um, that was causing them to flower early. Um, for you know, outside of the normal veg cycle, you know, they were starting to flower just from the heat or root bound or whatever. They just did not like it, so they're you know, one and done. You know, kick all those moms into flower, flower them out. Okay, cool. That'll be pre-roll flower or, or local, you know, discount weed flower or whatever. Nothing wrong with it. It's just 
okay, it, it flowered, it had a schedule that we wanted to put it on, so we, we're not going to clone that and use it, you know? Right, right. And I mean, I would assume, are you seeing that your clones are flowering a little bit earlier than your seeds, or are they still able to hold their veg as long as you'd like? I'm not going to veg them as long as I want to. I just keep the lights on. Okay. Um, so we're running, yeah, we're running, we have lights in all of our greenhouses that we can run. Now, our current light cycle is we run them in an hour at 9 o'clock, or 45 minutes, rather, at 9 o'clock, 45 minutes at midnight, and 45 minutes at 3 a.m. Uh, and that just breaks the nighttime up enough right. for them to uh, have it. And then we only really have to run about an hour and a half uh, total, um, you know, whatever, 3, 45, 45, 45. Um, this way we don't have to run that as, as much power and kind of right. cut down on our rent costs a little bit as well. For sure. I've also heard that there's there can be like rolling blackouts. So it would seem like it would make sense to run it, run it when there's less load on the on your on the grid. Yeah, we don't really have any power problems here. Um, if we get a, a like a cyclone, yeah, we can have power problems. But the, we haven't had any. It'll go out maybe for an hour or two if they're like main, doing maintenance or something. But we haven't had it go out more than about an hour and a half, except for when they were doing installation. That's good. I mean, would your, I mean, it seems like your plants would, if you don't have fans, do you have to have fans running in your greenhouse? <laughs> um, I mean, uh, we have fans running in all the greenhouses 24 hours a day, but uh, it, it would, it would survive. I mean, it'd get a little bit warmer in there, but they're screen greenhouses, right? So the, the walls can breathe. So, you know, it might be a little bit warmer in there, but it's not going to be that much warmer. Okay. Awesome. Um, what? Uh, so, you guys, you guys produce flour that's for the local market. I mean, is that correct? Is there, is there going to start being exporting in Thailand? Like, so we we have an import export license as well, um, but we have not uh, utilized that at this point. Um, right now, uh, I don't even know if you could. You might be able to try and do it, but I don't know if the rest of the infrastructure is in on the government side to like functionally make that happen. Um, I was the first person to legally import seeds into Zimbabwe, which was really cool. Uh, I have a whole funny story about that. So we had our, we imported the seeds in and we had all the paperwork and everything and the stamp from the government and all. So we go to pick them up at the airport and I'm like, yeah, here, I'm, I'm here to pick up my box. And they're like, well, what's in the box? And I was like, it's a bunch of cannabis seeds. And they're like, that's cool. You're under arrest. And I'm like, no, no, no. Here's my paperwork. <laughs> like, let's, let's, let's not jump to conclusions here, boys. Um, so, so I show them all my paperwork and they're like, okay, this is weird. We're going to go get the, the supervisor or whatever. So he comes down and he checks it out and he's like, all right. And he makes a phone call or whatever and he's like okay cool he's good so then they they open the box up because they like think i'm fucking with him or whatever so then there and it smells right because this stuff is like it had just been signed off on the coas and all the phytosanitaries and all the other happy horse shit we had to have um and uh it, it, there's like you know thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds but it has like that hint of like weed res you know not strong but like enough to tell it's weed right so they uh, they're like oh let's let's test the dog so they put the box out with a bunch of other boxes and they bring the dogs out and they like have them go through and the dogs don't hit on the box and they oh. suddenly went from kind of being happy cheery like let's fuck with the hippie to like we got ripped off with these dogs we're really pissed off and it was like can I get these seeds now and go like uh, I don't want to get it. I don't want you guys to be mad at me I didn't I didn't sell you the dogs can I, can I just get my seeds and go <laughs> like and I just immediately try to like get them and get the hell out of there so that was <laughs> a really interesting afternoon but that was a lot of fun I mean I gotta say it definitely takes a large set of balls to do cannabis business in other countries <laughs> that um you see you seem like you have a very unique temperament to be able to pull off interact you know the cannabis um politics and the politics of you know being a, a foreigner you know being in a different country i mean that sounds like a lot <laughs> I mean, I guess I never thought of it in that prospect, but like, I don't know, to me, it's an adventure, right? Like 
I have this incredible life where I've, I've worked hard to learn all this different stuff about cannabis and, you know, grow on all these different cool places and had a chance to see the world and travel the world, you know, growing cannabis. If you told me when I was 16 years old, that I was going to grow up and travel the world growing weed, I would have been like, you're crazy. Like whatever drugs you're on, like I need some of those. Uh, I would never have believed it. And it's kind of like, kind of like forced the reality that I wanted to live in. And, uh, I don't know. It just if you if you work hard and you uh, just spend a lot of time reading, like that's the biggest thing. Like spend an hour or two every night reading, learning new stuff. Like always learning my papers, talking to people like Matt Powers, Chris Trump, other people I really look up to, and and bouncing ideas off of them. Like like people like that, and and you know, kind of build your circle of people that you can trade ideas of and and build upon them. We have a great resource on my my Discord. We have a, and uh, actually, uh, Sungrown Mids actually Trevor he's got a great one as well. Uh, uh, open libraries, people that want to check out for um, you know different files and different to educate themselves in different books and stuff like that. Um, so you know, just spend a little bit of time every day just improving your your mind and your education on this stuff. And even if it's thirty minutes or fifteen minutes, uh, you'll 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 eventually be able to like kind of chip away and, and get to where you want to be. That and just luck and being at the right time. You know, I got into it in the cannabis trade back in the States uh, in, in Philadelphia when it was the black market days when you can get good prices and then jumped out to Colorado and uh, when I could do it and do it legally and then uh, ran with it from there because it was, you know, lucky enough to be an early, early on person in the commercial side and, and get some experience dealing with the regulatory side and license applications and you know, dealing with the Canadian government and writing an application and getting granted a license for an extraction facility in Canada was insane. Um, you know, a 45 page application was 1800 pages front and back when we finished the application, you know, that, that going through that whole process, writing out full SOPs for an entire cultivation and extraction facility and all that really, that was another big thing is writing out your whole processes, you know, make sure if you do that, that'll it'll help you a lot. And then just figure out what you're doing that maybe you can learn more about to improve upon stuff like that as well. Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of rambling a little bit, but no, I mean, it, it, it's all the stuff you're touching on is, is um, completely pertinent. You know, I lived in Washington for a little bit and looked into, you know, me and my wife looked into what it would take to, you know, get a license in Washington state. And I was, I was honestly overwhelmed. You know, I looked at, at all the different forms and all the different things that needed to happen. And I was like, shit, I was like, this is a job in itself. Just learning how to fill out these farms, you know, like I'm the simple farmer who likes to breed, you know, like let alone business, let alone all this stuff that's like, you know, hyper recorded and, you know, all of your standard operating procedures and all of those things, um, you know, respect, man. I mean, it's, it, it takes a lot to, to do those things and still have love for the plant, you know, and still, I mean, it takes a lot for sure. Um, what was your stint in Canada like? Um, I did some work with a couple of different companies. I did work with Green Relief Incorporated, um, which uh, <coughs> had some issues with uh, one of their exec. Anyways, I should probably not legally comment on that, but they had some issues with some of their executives. We'll leave it at that. Uh, and, um, and that didn't turn out so well, but that's, that's, you know, how a lot of that stuff ended up going. We had a big issue with the company I was working with in, in Medicine Hat, where we had one of our executives, uh, siphoning money out, out of the company. And that caused a bunch of drama with, with investors and some other stuff as well. So, uh, you know, that, that seemed embezzling people trying to, to embezzle money seems to be a common problem in the cannabis industry, unfortunately, especially in Canada. Um, Interesting. And, uh, um, just, uh, yeah. So that, that, I guess so that was the, the quick and dirty and also a couple other people that have micro licenses as well. I've worked with in, in Quebec and uh, Nova Scotia. Interesting. I, I lived in uh, British Columbia from 16 to 19. Okay. Um, and I'm an ice hockey player, so I moved there to play hockey. And I actually, when I moved there, I thought, okay, I'm going to quit smoking weed. I'm moving to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, sorry, go. Not in BC. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I moved into like the, they call it the lower mainland. So basically like, you know, right in 
the suburbs of Vancouver and it was very similar to where I live in the Bay Area. Very, very similar. It's like a Canadian version. And then I discovered the weed there and I discovered that the weed there was actually a lot cheaper than it is in California. And um, yeah, it, you know, I started smoking hash oil in Canada. I made some hash oil in Canada and I guess, geez, this was in like 90, 98. And um, that wasn't that common in California, at least in my crew, like making hash oil, but in British Columbia, it wasn't that big of a deal. And, you know, we would do hot knives and honey spoons and all of that kind of stuff. And it was, um, I mean, I'm sure there was many people that did this, but I, I would love to give myself credit as one of the people that brought hot knives to California, because when I was 16 and 17 years old, I, you know, make visits to the Bay Area during Christmas and the summer, and I would bring all my tech to the boys in Cali. And, you know, I'd bring like hot knives, they'd never seen that, and honey spoons and all kinds of, you know, Canadian lingo and way, you know, Canadian ways of smoking joints and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it was, it was a good time to, it was a good time to live in Canada during that time. It's a lot a lot more innocent, less of a police state, you know, like if you got rolled on by the cops for smoking weed, they wouldn't really like rough you up or anything. They just kind of would give you a hard time and tell you to kind of, you know, go on your way. Um, so that was, so I'm always, you know, interested to hear people's takes on, on the Canadian um, cannabis scene. Um, Cause I was kind of in that before it, I guess, before it became legal, and, you know, and all that kind of, whatnot well the black market scene is great i mean i i was i should probably be getting a little bit careful about what i say but i mean i used to go up there all the time to montreal when i lived in philadelphia when i was younger you know we used to do the a week i would run every other weekend there for a little while so heck yeah no i mean i i i i mean i grew up part of my you know poor, important parts of my life were in canada and you know, I, I, it really holds a, a special place in my heart. I, I, I love, you know, Canadians are my, are my peeps and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice, it's, it's a nice place. I, I like the vibes. There's tons of outdoor activities and, um, what, what are you showing me there? Oh, is that a bong? Is that a, a, a proper Thai bong? So this is, is, a uh, clay and, uh, bamboo. So this is like, Sick. let's, let's talk about like, this. I feel like in the hood, if you're like in the hood in Thailand or like just hanging out with the local villagers, like this is a good chance they're going to break this out. That's sick. So like people do smoke out of like sweet bamboo bongs out there. Like oh yeah, I actually have a video of how this one was made. I had one made for a friend of mine when he came out. His brother uh, also smokes weed, and uh, and we sent him home with one to to take to him as a gift. So, but. Uh, but yeah. Nice. And you said that there's like little smoke shops that you can smoke in that are like quasi legal. What are those like? Yeah. So like it kind of depends, right? So like in Bangkok and and the big cities, the tourist areas, they're gonna enforce the rules a little more. Except for like like Kosan Street and uh, Bangkok, you can kind of like they they'll sell whippets and all kind of like blues. You can buy nitrous by the balloon full that will order it with your beer and a joint like that. They don't care. But if you're not in those little like party zones, um, you know, it's not really tolerated so much there, but out like where I live. And then like, cause I live in Petraboon and Petraboon is like not tourist at all. Um, so out, out here, like the places have like lounge areas and stuff like that. Some places in Bangkok do too, but you don't have the shop in the lounge. It'll be like a different floor or a different room, but like separated, you know? Um, so that's kind of cool, but it's nice to be able to, a lot of times with the bars and stuff too, to just be able to like order a joint. If you forget your weeds or you burn through all your weed, you can just order a little weed uh, and, 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 you know, sit there and have your dinner or whatever else you're having at the restaurant, uh, depending on where you're at. But that's not usually as, uh, as above board as some of the other places, but uh I don't know. It's nice. They, uh, again, we, we're going to a big event this weekend, tomorrow night, um, and uh, it's supposed to be a big one of the first big events out here at Pachaboon. 
uh, as far as cannabis stuff goes. So that'll be a lot of fun tomorrow. Then in uh, 420, we have a big uh, uh, cannabis event we're going to be doing, uh, working with down in Bangkok. So uh, kind of be our first time uh, presenting or doing anything down there. I'll be giving a talk on, on cultivating out here and then also uh, uh, just hanging out and smoking and hanging out with people that are attending. So That's awesome. Um, so your name is Potent Ponics. Are you a, do you, do you grow aquaponically? Is that, do you use fish um, excrements for or fish water for your plants? Yep. In fact, all of our flowering uh, buildings here are all aquaponic. We have a, about a 2 million gallon pond that's next to our, our uh, greenhouses. We have a secondary additional one that's almost as large uh, that will be uh, filled up here soon. That'll be backup water basically for the rest of the farm um, long term. But uh, we have a ton of different fish in there. There's snakeheads, tilapia, uh, clown knife fish, catfish, a um, bunch of feeder fish. You know, there's betas in there. There's guppies in there. There's all kinds of stuff living in there. Um, and that water gets pumped up into premix tanks. And then we amend that based off of what we need the water to have. Uh, and adjust the pH down because the pH is like seven, seven, two until the rainy season comes back. So we have to lower the pH as well. So we can kind of adjust the nutrients of the what goes directly to the plants and then the runoff because we're only using organic inputs for the most part uh, or in very low levels than the ones that aren't. Um, th that just runs, but the runoff goes down through plumbing back into the pond. So we're just reusing that water as much as we're able to. That's cool. I was assuming that it was going to be a drain to waste. So it's not drain to waste. It goes back no, it was back in the pond, and then we, you know, we reuse it. That's awesome. Um, what I, my guessing is that you would need to add a few supplements for flowering. Is that correct, or not necessary? Yeah, we definitely boost the potassium in particular. Um, uh, is the biggest thing, and then we'll also hit them with like a uh, uh, when they first get transplanted, and then they switch over. We'll hit them with little molybdenum and mang uh, manganese just to make sure they have their targets for that, uh, for purple and for THC levels. Um, but uh, also helps a little bit with stress, you know, uh, silica as well. We're seeing a little bit of heat stress, which we hit them with a little extra um, aloe vera. Uh, it helps a lot with that. That's so exciting. Um, how do the, I mean, how do those plants taste? Like, I would assume they'd be dank. Yeah, we have really good ones. We're actually just finishing up the first cure of the first runs right now. I haven't actually smoked, except for some CBD runs. We had somebody give us some CBD starts, and I was like, I don't want these anywhere near the grow. So we have a tiny little, it's like a shed size greenhouse. That's a screen. It's just like the other greenhouse plastic on top. But uh, if somebody just gives us some random clones, they just go in there because I don't want to bring bugs into the garden. So. Um, we flowered those out and that one came out like a, like a peat chocolate peanut butter cup CBD strain, which was really interesting. So we have some seeds of that, but, uh, everything else that I've, I've done so far has been, uh, it's just hanging up and we'll be able to smoke it here for 420. We'll have a whole bunch of different cultivars. We'll have about, uh, 80 different cultivars so that we'll be able to, to start smoking here by 420. That's exciting. What is the... Like, what is the terpene difference with uh, aquaponics versus, let's say, like a living soil type of system? Or do you we can get you much higher total terpenes, yeah, because yeah. we have the aquatic microbes and the terrestrial microbes, so you get an additional activation of the plant's immune system. Um, you know, we're, we're hitting, you know, 4 to 6% terpene on a lot of the different strains that are able to do, produce those. So <clears throat> That sounds super cool, man. Um and is this the first time that you've grown aquaponically or have you, have you done aquaponics to scale in other environments? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I've, I've spent my life kind of the last 10 years perfecting commercial scale aquaponic cannabis. And uh, I have a whole online school, apmjclass.com. We teach, uh, uh, it's like a, a full week long aquaponic cannabis class. We actually uh, have uh, new farm tours and a uh, bunch of new content. We add to that semi-regularly a couple times a year. We kind of keep the, the, the information fresh. It's a one-time buy, but we, we add new content to it a, a few times a year. So, you know, you kind of buy into that library that, that's constantly growing. 
That's super exciting. I definitely, definitely want to to follow up on that and, you know, see, see about, about taking that class. Um, Cause I, re I recall like digging into aquaponics maybe like 20 years ago and just like seeing some really cool, gosh, it was a Jeff, it was this guy in Australia. I don't recall what his name was, but he has this epic aquaponic garden. He grows in like gravel. He has like papaya trees and all kinds of really interesting stuff. And of course, you know, as a stoner, you're like, oh, like, could we grow weed this way? And, you know, it just kind of was like left at that. And then- Murray Randall, Hollum. Sorry? Murray Hollum. Yes, yeah, that's him. And um, like randomly, this, this is awesome that you're on because randomly, I know I've, I've definitely heard your heard you on various podcasts because I was like growing with the fishes. I'm like, I'm like, I've heard of that, you know. So I've definitely, um, you know, I've definitely heard some of your shows before, and yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I mean, it's just a really exciting way to cultivate and. You know, it's just, oh, man, that was cool when you hit that bong rip, you disappeared in the smoke. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's just like, like, to me, like, that's like what cannabis is like the gateway is into like KNF and aquaponics and all these different ways of growing and all these, like, you know, different ways of learning about the, you know, the biosphere and nature and, all, you know, all, all of that to me is like, is the medicine, is you know, like why I'm so drawn to this is because the other people that are also drawn to it are so interesting, you know, and have so much, like, have so much to teach that it's like, oh yeah, like I can look into aquaponic cannabis gardening and all of the different ins and outs of that. I mean, like for me, honestly, what I would really love to do is to have, have an aquapon, have like a fish tank at the top of my property and to be able to water the fish solids to my garden and then refill my tank and that's kind of like the way that i think it would be really cool to do it um and also it seems like that would add you know the amount of nutrient density that that would add to your garden would be second to none and it seems like that would kind of be similar to adding like grazing animals to your land you know what i mean but instead of it being like an actual Instead of it being a moving a, a four-legged animal, it would just be fish and like their excrements. Is that is that kind of what the the fish adds to your to the your soil? Absolutely, yeah. So it's basically like fish manure. So the difference is, is that it tends to be higher in nitrates and and lower in, in ammonia, um, which uh, the plants have to convert uh, in order to from uh, nitrates back to ammonia. They tend to grow faster. Um, you just have to make sure you back off the feeding rate of the fish when you're in late in the flower. You don't want to get those plants too much nitrogen because they'll get larfy uh, and they won't get that that nugs that you're looking for. So, uh, or switch over to like an omn omnivorous or or a herbivorous fish um, that's going to have much less nitrogen. Uh, in general, rule of thumb is the more protein percentage in the fish food, the more nitrogen output you're going to get. Um, so keep that in mind uh, with the fish species that you're. Uh, you're keeping uh if you're trying to dial it in on it especially on bigger scales um do you guys eat the fish oh yeah and i actually have a i posted a picture on instagram of a huge clown knife that we caught the other day in there and uh, yeah we cooked that up so do you like how big is your pond um about a football field long Maybe not quite, <laughs> like two to three hundred feet long, and then forty feet wide, fifty feet wide, maybe, and then twenty-five, thirty feet deep. So it's like a lake. Yeah, kind it's of. huge. Yeah. And so, do you fish in the lake? Yeah. What? That's so awesome. <laughs> Because when, when the flooding comes, like all the water comes and we have a little spillway, right? So when the uh, rice fields flood, it'll like spill over to top the ponds off. And then that spills over so that it doesn't get too full. But um, it, it, when the, because 
Do they have different levees and stuff that they do to, to flood the different zones, to, to flood the fields when the when the rice come, you know, for the rice and all. And um, yeah, it, it's pretty wild because then you get all, all these different random fish that come washing in from the river. You know, that's how we ended up with so many different species in there. Um, you know, we didn't add them. They just, when the rainy season comes, once those weirs open, they, they flood in the top off the ponds and you get whatever comes in, you know? That's really, that's cool. And there's also yeah, huge awesome. rice culture there. Yeah, we're surrounded by rice fields all around us. In fact, the greenhouses are cur where the greenhouses are was a rice field last wet season. Man, okay. And I mean, it's is there Thai culture with washing rice and like IMOs and all of that stuff as well? So rice wash they'll use, so they'll do rice wash and they'll ferment it in the sun for two weeks or yeah, two months. And then they use that as like a fungal spray. It's like, a, I don't know the science behind it or if it's that much different than anything else. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to microscope it yet, but uh, we're going to try making some. I just found out about this my last trip up to Calco. And then I mentioned it to the people here and they're like, oh yeah, it's this one over here. And they have, because if you go to any Thai farm, they'll have any, most Thai, Thai people that grow, they'll have their juicy, which is like, it's really similar to like PSB and KNF, which is like MSG, fish sauce, and egg, uh, you know, and they mix it together, sometimes a little sugar, uh, and then they'll mix that together and then put that in the sun, and that makes like a phosphorus solubilizing um, microbial inoculant. Uh, and then they also do this rice wash, and then they'll do sometimes other ones. Um, I'm still not fully sure on some of the other ones, but they also do a, a fish ferment, which I also have a video on my YouTube. Um, so we'll buy like 20 or 40 kilos of fish, like small little like tetra sized fish um, that the guys get from the river or whatever. I don't know, we buy them at the market. Uh, and then we take those, we put them in uh, big trash cans and then we put um, the uh, IPMO and then we also put, you, the government gives out these little packets of um, like fermentation microbes and different garden microbes for people to have so that they're not using chemicals and stuff. So uh, we take a little inoculant from the fermentation one that they have for breaking down plant waste. Uh, and that, we mix that all together with a little bit of water. And then the other thing that we do with the stuff, and this really seems to help with the vigor in the plants. Uh, if you're gonna do the, um, FAA this way and um, make sure you get a bunch of snails as well. We'll buy like, you know, five or 10 kilos of snail shells um, that's left over um, that they sell at the market. You know, they pull the snails out for cooking and they have all these shells. We'll, we'll take that and ferment it in because that once that starts to break down after about 14 days, it's so acidic, so acidic that it just melts those shells and turns it into super bioavailable calcium. So, um, when we mix that all together and feed it to the plants, they have this nitrogen and calcium and the plants really just kind of take off. That's super interesting. Um, so the government, you said that the government supplies people with organic IMOs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, anybody in Thailand that's like trying to grow vegetables, every household can get so many packets a, a, a month. <laughs> Uh, at local agricultural extension or whatever the Thai equivalent is. And then I don't have any packets here at the house, but uh, I do at the farm, but um, they're like little packets of microbes that you can get from the government. And um, we just get the ones for the fish from it just because it doesn't take much, right? Like we can make like five or eight trash cans from one little tiny packet just because you're sprinkling the microbes into inoculate it, right? You don't need much of it. You just need to get them started. That's awesome. So basically the government is is really encouraging people to grow organically. I mean, yeah, they have laid on that they, a little bit. Yeah, they have like little packets for biocontrols. It's like a Bavaria bassiana and metarizium and something else mix. And like they give it's like a little garden kit. And they have like this is for this and this is for that and this is for this and this is for like your compost and whatever, whatever. Um uh, that the government gives out here, yeah, which is a what, pretty what cool is program. What is the behind that? They're trying to uh, like feed everybody and get them to like adopt 
you know, better practices. So they give it out for free to kind of be like, here, like this, like learn how to do it. And we'll provide it for you, uh, which I think is great. That is great. I mean, it's, it, I've never heard of a country doing that. Maybe there's some South American countries that are doing that, but are, are you so, familiar with in Zimbabwe, they had a supplement. In Jamaica, too, they had um, stuff that was subsidized, right? So, like, they're cheap. Like, they still cost money, but the, the government pays for, like, a large percentage of the seed um, and from the government seed shop. And then in Zimbabwe, they had, like, you could get so... If you had a farm above a certain size, you could get, like, so much of certain seeds um, for every acre or whatever. Uh, and then if you bought so much you get a more for free or whatever does that make sense yeah so like you buy enough for your first acre and they'll give you the one for the second acre kind of thing i mean it, that sounds it's kind of sad because to me man i'm getting a little echo um let me see if i can fix it on my end if you're, if it's bad i can switch to headphones i think it's okay oh or that's this way better thank you um it's sad that to me this sounds like such a novel idea it makes complete sense i guess just living in the united states for most of my i mean being from here that sounds like such a crazy idea but it, it I, I mean it's not really um they're just encouraging their their people to grow organically and that's man that made me feel kind of sad that like <laughs> In the United States, that's you know that's that's so far off of the of the conversation of you know subsidizing organic agriculture. Um, that that's awesome that you're a part of that. That's really awesome, and that's awesome that that you're sharing that with with people that we could think that that is a possibility. Um, yeah, that's that's really awesome. It ma it makes complete sense. It does make complete sense. Especially if you're trying to change practices to like away from toxic chemicals and stuff, That that's how you're going to do it and actually get it, uh, you know, people to adopt it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there, I mean, I assume there is also a lot of agro-business pressure in Thailand as well. Is that? Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of different types of agriculture here, but uh, um, depending on where you are, I mean, if you're out more a little east of here, uh, they have a lot of elephant problems. Elephants eating people's crops, which is something you don't have to deal with in the States. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah, man. Um, man, so interesting. Um Is there anything that you would like to touch on that I haven't I haven't gotten into? I think we're kind of rounding the end. I might have like one or two more questions, but I would just say like anyone that's thinking about just jumping off and trying to run to the tropics to grow, um, read up on how to grow vegetables and other crops here before you just run and do that because you will get your ass handed to you if you just show up and think that you can grow like you can Cali style um the you know the bugs are different the humidity is different the design of greenhouses is different to deal with those type the, the heat in particular having a double split top and things like i call it i'm sorry i didn't mean about the mic a double split top at the top of the greenhouse to, to dump that heat out from both sides things like that like learn about these different types of methods that you have to know about for these tropical places before you you jump in with both feet into a place like this so that you will be successful and then also like one thing that we always do too is take a, you know 150 200 percent of the clones that you need if you run into a bump or two okay it's fine right like we still have more than enough we need to fill our own greenhouses and we have some stuff that we can sell and then we have backups for everything you know so make sure you always kind of have buffer room so that you can have some stuff go wrong and immediately replace it with fresh plants and stay on schedule uh if you do run into a tiny problem or some kind of you know electrical failure and all your fans fail and the greenhouse cooks off or stuff happens once in a while right like circuit breakers blow i've seen like ants get into an electrical box and fry it like oh wow 
uh, all kinds of weird stuff happens, you know? Um, so. How, how many years have you been growing in the tropics for? Uh, off and on, oh, a total, probably five years in total if I added up all the different years in different places. But like, let's say off and on, when have you like, when you started growing in the tropics to now? Oh, I, the first time I grew was in 2016 in Jamaica. Okay. And then compared to now, like I, I, I am so much wiser about biocontrols. And then also like, I think the other thing too, is I don't panic anymore when I run into problems. Like when you're young, a little bit younger and stuff like that, you're like, oh shit, what do I do? How do I get, I, 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 you know, you, you don't know the answers to all this stuff. And then now, like, I'm not saying I know all the answers by any means, but I know, I, okay, a fungal thing. Okay. I know a couple different things I can throw at it and it's it, something's going to stick it, you know, and then I can, once I know kind of what's, what, what it's weak to, then I can, I can hit it hard with a couple different versions of that or whatever. Same thing with bugs, right? Like, uh, okay. It's got six legs. Cool. Bavaria bassiana, metarhizium, IPMO that combo is going to kill 98% of them. Right. Or it's got, you know, it's a mite. Okay, cool. So we're going to hit it with white oil and wood vinegar and um, maybe, uh, um, you know, a neem oil as a, if it's in veg um, and to, to knock them down, you know, so it just depends on, on what it is that we're, we're dealing with uh, what stage of growth, but, you know, kind of have an adaptation of stuff. And then two, that's one of the other things is uh, finding different, sourcing different things and different biocontrols and different oils like we don't have soft oil x here which is something that everyone kind of swears by in the states we have to go with agricultural white oil which is very similar uh in application here but you know if you don't know that and you're not used to dealing with like sourcing things based off of active ingredients and things like that it can be really hard to uh to jump from market to market and find those same products without having because you know and i've seen grows out here where they've imported you know, uh, 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 what is it, Lost Coast? Of Plant therapy, yeah. Or spider mites, and then they got like a bunch of West Coast nutrients and mammoth pea and all this other stuff. And listen, I love a colon and mammoth pea and everything, but like you're importing that from the United States to here, like the amount of money that you're spending just in import stuff is like, holy crap. So like you got to keep your costs down and, do, and, and make sure that you're, and uh, you know, Keep it, you know, that, that, that's probably been the biggest thing that surprises me is seeing how many people are still relying on Western, like, brands for your inputs. Like, come on, make your own nutrients and, and source the, the same active ingredients with your pest controls. Not only that, but we have better pest controls than you guys do. We have combination stuff that's combo Bavaria balsiana metarhizium. I have one that's a six in one that has, like, uh, Militaris and. Uh, Isaria fumus seraceae and like a, it's basically like a, a nuclear bomb for anything with six legs it's it's freaking great um uh, and that we have that we use in our rotation now um you know so you know we have a lot of different so one thing that's interesting too is the wood vinegar you know we i don't think i've ever seen that in the united states and that really does add like a bit of a vigor to the plants i definitely notice the plants are a little you know they're, they're always praying the day after we spray it in the evening uh, the next day so i've never heard of wood vinegar so it's like a vinegar that that they run through with uh, i don't know if it's sugarcane smoke or it's some kind of um or if it's rice hull smoke it's one or the other but they like boil it in like a bong kind of where they run the smoke through the oil and it like f smells like a barbecue when you spray it in there but it, it kills a lot of the bugs and especially mites. It's really good against the mites out here to, as a preventative. Uh, and it, it, the vinegar uh, is kind of acidic, so it kills the, the powdery mildew or any molds or anything on the leaf surface. Uh, and it, um, if you know, you don't want to spray it, you know, in the flower, but in veg, in particular, it works extremely well. Or even an early flower, you can use it to, you know, if you had a bit of an emergency. But it's certainly something that. Uh, um, you know, seems to work extremely well here and uh, um, not have any kind of negative uh, side effects that we've noticed. That's awesome, wood vinegar. Um, well, shoot, I think I'd like to, to wrap her up around here. Um, 
I would love for you mm -hmm. to email me some of the resources that you were mentioning during the podcast, just so mm -hmm. I can, you know, like, you know, put up as much stuff to like, you know, rep, you know, your podcast and the class that you're teaching, um, you know, and, and anything else like that. When I, when I air this live, um, I'm going to probably run through your, your Instagram. So like while you're talking, you can also show pictures of some of your stuff, <clears throat> which I think would be super cool. Um, gosh. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, dude, thank you. Thank you very much for, for coming on. Um, I mean, we've never really like met or talked before this, so it's really awesome that you're, you know, extremely friendly and open to share with the community what you've been up to. And, you know, like you already are sharing your own stuff and, um, you know, oh yeah. So yeah. Um, okay. No, I did say that. Yeah, I knew the, when we were talking about Jamaica too, I have videos of like the, the whole field of stuff and flower and then the veg stuff with the field that were short. You can put that up too if you want to talk while we're talking about that. If that helps you, you know, I like would love have to something visual to follow along with. Um, both of those videos are like the first couple on my main page when you go to my YouTube. So if okay. that helps you have something visual on the screen while you're doing it, since that's recorded, that you know, feel free to. So you have a you you have the YouTube which is growing with the fish, Pot potent ponics, potent potent ponics, potent. Onyx, and what is your the website for um, uh, my website is potentponics.com potentponics.com and, mm -hmm. and the open nutrient project is open nutrient project.com and um, my podcast is on all uh, podcast apps uh, Spotify iTunes YouTube Google um, every platform really and you said that you, what was the APMJ.com? APMJclass.com. That's my, uh, I have a whole school on Teachable. If you're ever going to do your own educational stuff, Teachable is by far the best platform. It's not the cheapest. It's like, I don't know. Uh, if you, if you get it in Christmas time or like when it's on sale, it's like a thousand bucks. Otherwise, it's like twelve hundred bucks a year for the tier that we have. Um, but like, once you have that, they don't take any cut off of it the rest of the time. So I can sell as much as I want, and they get zero dollars of that. And they have really good, like within twelve hours, they've always been really on point with tech support. And we've had them for four and a half, five years that we've hosted our classes. I have three classes on there. I have a pest control class and a the, the aquaponic cannabis class and I have a couple others that I'm I have them almost completed or I have the stuff filmed and stuff I just have to finish editing and cutting it down and formatting it um, that's, but, that's, uh, that's, if, if you're ever looking to do something like that it's definitely the best platform they also have a cheap one too it's like 300 bucks a year and then they take like eight percent of whatever your sales are which is not really that bad of a deal either that's that's really that's really neat I've been um working with uh, junior colleges teaching cannabis courses um so you know it's cool in that you know I, there's less of the back end stuff that i have to organize myself but um you know i'm it's just i'm really happy to see you know more people getting into teaching and the information in this in this industry because for a long time it was kind of like a hidden information that only certain people got to got to know and it's great that everybody should have that information and i also think it's important that people who learn it should be able to get paid you know compensated for the work that they put in because then it gives them time to make it even better um yeah i uh i haven't figured out that part of it yet but uh at least the, the school part of it does definitely puts a little money in my pocket but the podcast certainly doesn't um i also have put on the uh, virtual aquaponic cannabis conference every year um, if you haven't checked that out, we have three years of, of conferences on that. Uh, each year we had at least 24 hours of, of content each, each year. So, uh, be sure to check that out. Um, 
really unique talks, really interesting talks, incredible talk on hoplite and viroid uh, from Kevin McKernan this last year uh, and some other great stuff. So definitely check that out. For sure, man. Thank you so much, Steve, for coming on. Like, I, I really appreciate it. If you are ever in the California Bay Area, hit me up. Let's uh, let's smoke some bowls. Have you, have you interviewed Wayne Justman? No. You should. If you need his contact info, just send it, ask, let me know. I can send it to you. Wayne so he Justman. was the first person to get a medical cannabis card. And he uh, was good friends with Dennis Perone. Oh, yeah. And the whole Perone clan. I actually knew Dennis Perone the last two years of his life and spent quite a bit of time at the castle there for a little bit when I was living in the Bay. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, the 215, I'm from the Bay Area, so like I'm partial, but I really love the way that 215 was 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 set up you know, what Dennis Perone and all those people were about, how they, you know, started it as medicine and, you know, the whole collective aspect, like it, that, you know, I mean, that really got people like me into this, into this industry. Um, and, you know, I, I just, you know, now it's more corporate, but, you know, the people, there still is that vibe behind it. And, you know, I, I guess to the, to the listeners, you know, like, the name of the show is the East Bay Seed Collective Show because we are a seed collective out of the East Bay. And, you know, the purpose of our collective is to share genetics, to, you know, pheno hunt together and to generally just work together as a collective to push forward this plant. And, you know, um, this podcast is, you know, an extension of that. And, you know, I always encourage other people to to work together with, you know, their their community to produce you know to make the 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 world a better place really i mean whether it's cannabis or social justice or you know food you know education whatever you know it's about us being here together to to make this the world we live in a better place um yeah um so yeah man thank you i will stop this podcast i will stop it right now and recording